Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Snyder's Inc. We're continuing with the Mr. Ball, and you already know that. You know him that. You've known that coming in. And this is Top 3 Videos with Disturbing Backstories Part 4. So there is not a Part 3. So I don't know if that's a video that's missing or something, but there's not a Part 3. So... Just, just wanted to point that out. It's not, I haven't missed one this time. I looked, there's not a Part 3. So I don't know what's going on with that. But I need you all to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, comment what you think down below. Let's get right into this though. Again, Top 3 Videos with Disturbing Backstories Part 2. Four. Let's get into it. Today, I'm going to share with you three progressively more disturbing stories, and at the end of each of them, I'm going to share the video that is famously associated with them. But before I get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do, and I upload three, four, even five times every week. That's gone down to more like one or two, but the stories she tells are really good. So if that's of interest to you, please ask the like button if you can borrow their car and then return it with the gas gauge on empty. Also, please subscribe to this that's just wrong. channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Disturbing images and statements via discretion and advice. Oh no. This wild child. Anna Malaya was born November 4th, 1983, to very poor and alcoholic parents in the Ukraine. In the winter of 1986, when Oksana was only three years old, in a drunken stupor, her parents forgot about her outside in the cold of winter. What the fuck, you stupid ass parents? Who the hell leaves the child out in the middle when we're all drunk? You, you stupid drunk bastards. Oh, I hope your parents got it. Oh, I hope they got arrested. Oh, I hope they get arrested. And because she was locked out, instinctively she crawled towards the nearest source of warmth, which was the family's kennel where a whole bunch of dogs were sleeping. And incredibly, once she crawled inside of this kennel, not only did the dogs allow her to sleep there that night, but they kind of embraced her as one of their own. The dogs probably felt the pain and emotion she's gone through because the dogs have really good sense for shit. So the dog probably saw that and were like, hey, we'll take her as one of our own and we'll make sure she is safe and comfortable and all that. That's probably what the thought process was. The next day, Oksana did not go back in the house, and her parents seemingly did not notice her absence. And over the next five years, Oksana... What? Hold on, this parents forgot... Please tell me this parents got arrested. These parents are the worst parents I've ever seen. This is the worst damn thing I've ever seen. I've seen some scenarios where some parents have left children. I've never seen people where parents have forgotten about the child for five fucking years. How is that possible? I would stay with this family of dogs, essentially living like she was part of their pack, which meant over those five very formative years from ages three to eight years old, Oksana had almost no interaction with humans. Oksana rapidly learned how to behave like a dog and began only walking on all fours. She would bark instead of try to speak and she would eat raw meat. By the- I can't even get mad at, I'm not mad at the child for that. That child has been raised by dogs, kept by dogs. So of course you're gonna end up acting and behaving like that, especially from three to eight. That's when you kind of adapt. You're supposed to learn the important things like talking and all that. But that's not the case. She was on dog, so because of that, she had to, she her body and I started to act and embrace the thing of a dog. In the early 90s, Oksana no longer identified as a human. She identified as a dog. And it was in the early 90s when a passerby happened to see Oksana running around on all fours in the back of her house in the woods, and they called the police, wondering what was wrong with this person. The police show up, and Oksana's dog family runs out and starts barking at the police to protect Oksana, and Oksana would start barking ferociously to protect herself from being captured. But eventually, the police would use meat to lure the rest of the dogs away, so they could retrieve the child. When she was taken into custody, doctors saw that she not only had forgotten how to walk on two legs, she also couldn't speak. And doctors were concerned that because she had had almost no exposure to human language, 
for all those formative early years that she might not actually have the capacity to speak anymore. Oksana was taken to an orphanage where she would eventually learn how to walk on two legs and, amazingly, she would learn how to speak. But despite these incredible gains she made towards re-entering society, her experience living with the dogs had really left a mark on her. Although she could speak, she could only speak in monotone with no rhythm and no intonation, and it was actually difficult to follow what she was saying because of that. A psychologist did an assessment of Oksana and determined that her mental capacity was only that of a six-year-old, despite being a young adult at the time of this assessment. By the time she was 22 years Years old and had more or less re-entered society, she finally was able to have a boyfriend and he didn't know much about her past. But when she decided to show him how easy it was for her to run around and bark like a dog, it apparently scared him and he broke up with her and did not see her again. Okay, please help me explain context, right? She didn't just randomly as you were walking just start running on all fours and barking like a dog. No, that's gonna be really weird. That's weird to any person. That's really weird. Don't, please tell me she gave him contact. If she did not give him talk, draw on text. Like, okay, please tell me she explained, listen, I, I would, I, I, for five years, I was raised by these pack of dogs because my parents were very drunk and forgot about me, so I learned the ability to die like a dog. That's why I talk the way I do. Would you like to see how, I, like, how easy it is for me to do that? Please tell me she was just like, hey, you want to see me how I can... Uh, act like a dog. He was just like, sure, and then she freaking did. Please, oh my god, I hope that was context given. Today, Oksana lives on a farm taking care of animals, and she was recently interviewed on a Ukrainian talk show where she says she no longer wants to live like or act like a dog, she just wants to be a person. Here is some footage of Oksana Malaya acting like a dog. That's insane that that happened to this girl and how much that probably messed up her mentalness for so long. How much it took her to get back to her just being herself and wanting to be around people and be human. And I, wow, that's gotta have messed her up. After being apart for many years, identical twin sisters Ursula and Sabina Erickson were finally reunited on May 15th, 2008. With I already have a feeling I know where this is going. I know this story, I'm pretty sure. Within 24 hours of their long-awaited reunion, the 41-year-old Swedish sisters boarded a ferry for Liverpool, England. They arrived in Liverpool at 8.30 in the morning on Saturday, May 17th, and their first stop was going to the St. Anne's police station, where Sabina would tell them that she's very concerned for the safety of her kids back in Ireland. The police would say, okay, we'll follow up, and they got in touch with their counterparts in Dublin, Ireland, who went over to the house and everything was fine. So the women leave the police station on foot and they make their way over to a bus stop, and they ultimately board a bus bound for London at about 11.30 in the morning. So they get in the bus and they start moving, and the driver asks them to take their luggage and put it in the luggage hold. But the women aggressively refuse to give up their luggage, and in fact, they start clutching their luggage against their chest. So the driver starts to feel really uncomfortable comfortable about having these two women on the bus and ultimately decides to just pull over at a service station outside of the city and tell them to get off the bus. They so these two, well, I, I know the story, but I was going to give things. So these two were sitting on the bus and he said, hey, put your luggage in the luggage um, area. Wait, do you ever put your luggage? He probably gave a thing, but I missed it. Hold on. The driver starts to feel their luggage and in fact they start the luggage hold but the so he asked them to put them in the luggage hold and they refused they are clutching to their luggage like there's something they don't want everyone to know and the uh, driver is feeling really uncomfortable because he doesn't know what's in these luggage now and these guys are being very protective and it was very suspicious so probably he's like hey these are people want on a bus we saw a service station he pulled out a service station Get off the bus. The women aggressively. 
I can understand it completely. Refuse to give up their luggage. And in fact, they start clutching their luggage against their chest. So the driver starts to feel really uncomfortable about having these two women on the bus and ultimately decides to just pull over at a service station outside of the city and tell them to get off the bus. They get off and the driver ends up calling the police and telling them there's something weird going on with these two women. I don't know what's inside their bags, but you might want to come check it out. As it happened, there was already a police officer at the service station who came right over to the women and started talking to them as the bus driver took off. During their conversation, the police officer felt like these two women were not a threat to anybody and it was just a big misunderstanding and they let them go. So th I can understand, I mean, if anything, if there's nothing, there, because there's probably nothing in the luggage, that's the thing. So if there's nothing in the luggage and these people, they're acting fine, then I guess, he, well, I mean, they have no reason to be suspicious of them, like no reason to keep them or suspect them of anything, so he has to let them go. So the officer leaves and these two women who don't have a car start walking down the highway on foot. Shortly thereafter, a security camera on the highway picks up the two women walking down the median of this very busy highway. And at some point, they try to cross the street. And it's obvious as you're watching this video that they're not gonna make it. There's so many cars. And immediately, Sabina gets hit by a car. Now, Sabina was only grazed by the car, so she was okay. And she and her sister went back to the median of this highway, but- That just shows you how insane that mindset. They're just running in the traffic. They know you're not gonna get a car. They're just trying to get hit and they're just getting hit by a car, like what the hell? Enough motorists saw this happen that they called the police. And it just so happened that the responding patrol car that was in the area was being shadowed by a film crew that was filming for a TV show called Traffic Cops. So this patrol car shows up with cameras rolling and they're able to get the sisters from the median over to the shoulder on the other side of the road. And they're talking to them like, what's going on? What are you doing here? And on camera, everything seems totally fine. Like there is no major issues here. These women were just stranded and were making some bad decisions walking down a highway on foot. Then all of a sudden, Ursula turns away from the officers and tries to run into traffic. And there are cars whizzing by. They have not stopped traffic. And one of the officers manages to grab her arm, but only gets her jacket, which she's able to wriggle out of before launching into traffic, literally leaping into traffic and gets hit by a huge truck going 60 miles an hour and gets thrown down the road. Literally a second later, as everyone's like, what is going on? Sabina yells, they're going to steal your organs. And she leaps into traffic and gets hit by another car. Immediately, police run in the road. They stop traffic and they go up to Ursula, who was the first to get hit. What are they thinking of? Like, what the hell? Is, what is going on where these two women are sitting there? There's literally no reason to um, think this way. None. There's no reason to think this way. These women, for some bizarre reason, believe these people are after them. They believe for some reason these that everyone's after them. Uh, they're sitting there chatting normally. They randomly run to the road. One just get runs in and dives into a truck going 60 miles an hour and gets launched on the thing. The fact she's alive, if she is, is shocking. Um, the other one then screams, they're gonna steal your old organs and fucking runs on the table. What the hell? They lost it. They got my, their minds are gone. They lost their minds. Yeah, and they see her legs are definitely broken, but she's alive. As How? How is she alive? For Sabina, she was totally unconscious and they didn't know if she was gonna make it. When the paramedics finally show up, Ursula, who has the broken legs, fights to sit up and they're trying to tell her like, lay down, you're hurt, you have shattered legs, you're lucky to be alive, lay down. She's not listening. In fact, she's violently trying to sit up and she starts spitting at the paramedics and the police and screaming obscenities at them like they're trying to hurt her and they're like, they have some weird, but these two women are believing that everyone's after them. I don't know why, I don't know what happened, but that's what these two women are probably believing. We're the police, we're the paramedics, we're trying to help you. At the same time, Sabina regains consciousness, and even though paramedics and police are trying to keep her laying on the ground, she begins fighting her way up and is pushing the police off of her and finally stands up and literally squares off with one of the police officers and decks her in the face before running down the road. Police would have to run down the road after her and literally surround her as she's got her fists up like she's gonna fight anybody that touches her, and they would have to tackle her to the ground and put her in handcuffs just to keep her from hurting herself both
This what these women are freaking insane. Sisters would be transported to the hospital, and when they got there, they both apparently were acting normal again. Ursula, because of her broken legs, would be admitted to the hospital, and apparently she would stay normal and would eventually make a recovery and would be released. There were no charges pressed against her. As for Sabina, the doctors checked her out, and she didn't appear to have any injuries. So they released her, and she was brought to the police station to be charged for punching the police officer in the face. That day, Sabina would plead guilty to her charges and would be sentenced to one day in custody that she served that night. The next day, she was released. So Sabina- Who the heck did start to hit a police officer for a day? What? Sabina leaves the police station on foot, and later that night, she's walking down the road when she sees two men walking towards her who were named Glenn and Peter. She stops them and she says, hey, I'm looking for a bed and breakfast. Are there any good ones nearby? And Glenn would say, you know, it's funny. I own a bed and breakfast. You can stay at mine. Initially, Sabina seemed hesitant, like perhaps this was a trap, but ultimately she agrees and the three of them go back to Glenn's B&B. Once they got there, Sabina apparently was constantly looking out all of the windows, acting very paranoid, and then at one point she offers the men a cigarette and the men accept and she hands them their cigarette and she's about to light their cigarettes when she suddenly snatches them out of their mouths and says, oh, these might be poisoned and she throws them in the trash. Just before midnight. This girl is so freaking bizarre. This girl has so much issues with her. Peter leaves and Glenn and Sabina go to sleep in their respective rooms. The next day, Glenn gets up to make tea and food for Sabina who's downstairs in the kitchen but Glenn realizes he's out of tea bags. So he goes outside and he hollers to his neighbor, Frank, and says, hey, can I borrow some tea bags? Frank gives him the tea bags. Glenn goes back inside. About a minute later, Frank recalls seeing Glenn stagger out of the B&B, clutching his stomach, screaming, she stabbed me. And apparently his last words were, Frank, take care of my dog before he ultimately died. Frank immediately- What the hell is wrong with this woman? Why is she randomly stabbing him now? calls the police and Sabina immediately leaves the B&B and takes off running. She gets to a highway and she's running along the side of this highway and a motorist named Josh sees Sabina running and she's clutching a hammer that she's repeatedly hitting herself in the head with as she's running. Josh drives well past her and gets out to try to intercept her but as she's running past him she pulls a roof tile out of her pocket and throws it and hits Josh in the head. She runs past Josh who's now clutching his head and can't stop her she gets to this bridge that overlooks another road and she leaps off it's 40 feet to the ground and when she hits the ground she breaks both ankles and fractures her skull but she lives and narrowly escapes being hit by another car eventually this girl is so much wrong with her there's so much not right this girl needs to see mental health this girl needs mental health a lot of mental health and i feel this girl is this girl caused the other girl's behavior police and paramedics are called who transfer Sabina to a hospital where she once again is acting totally normal. Nothing like the crazy person that killed Glenn or was throwing roof tiles just hours earlier. Sabina would ultimately be arrested for murdering Glenn and she would plead guilty to manslaughter but she gave absolutely no explanation of why any of this happened. It was like she didn't understand and was a different person now. The defense claimed that although Sabina certainly killed Glenn, she should have diminished responsibility because she was suffering from a condition known as folly ado. It's a French term that means madness of two. And basically it only presents itself in identical twins where one twin has a psychotic break and they transmit their insanity to the other twin. And amazingly, the prosecution accepted this claim. That's ridiculous because it should be her. I think she gave the other girl because the other girl got away from her and was normal. Not vice versa. And they only gave Sabina five years for her crimes. Sabina would serve her five year sentence and was released in 2011 and to this day is a free woman. Here are some highlights from that film crew that captured Ursula and Sabina acting totally crazy on the side of the highway. What the hell? That girl is psychotic. That girl needs mental health. 
In June of 2011, law student Lauren Giddings was only one test away from completing her dream and becoming a public defender. Even though she had a ton of studying still to do, she had taken off the first week in June to go to her sister's wedding where she was the maid of honor. Right before she left the wedding to go back to school, she joked with her family that she was going to be locking herself in the library and just studying 24-7 and that nobody should get in touch with her. But when she got back to campus, none of her classmates that she studied with saw her at the library. And in fact, when they didn't see her for a couple of days, they started reaching out to her and texting her and calling her to see if she was okay. But she never picked up, she never wrote back, and so no one knew what was going on with her. One of Lauren's classmates would reach out to Lauren's sister and would ask her, hey, have you talked to your sister at all because we haven't seen her? And Lauren's sister would write back and say, oh no, everything is just fine. Lauren told us before she left the wedding that she was going to be locking herself away and just studying 24-7, so I'm sure everything is just fine. But this... I could understand the YT would think that, but then it didn't because if no one can hold her like four or five days, there's more to that. There's more to it. His classmate wasn't convinced because this felt very uncharacteristic of Lauren to not study at the library and then not to pick up any phone calls or text messages. So she would call the police and say, hey, can you please go check on Lauren's apartment because I think something's wrong. So a police officer goes over to Lauren's apartment and knocks on the door. Lauren doesn't answer. They try the door. It's locked. The officer goes outside and looks around the outside of her apartment. There's no broken windows. There's no obvious signs of a break-in. And so the officer leaves and says, I can't do anything else unless you guys file a missing person report. Well, just file one for them. So a couple of days go by and there's still no word from Lauren. And at this point, Lauren's family is now concerned and they do file a missing persons report. So the police go back to Lauren's apartment. They try knocking. She doesn't come to the door. The door is still locked. So they get the owner of the apartment building to open up her door. And when they go inside, Lauren's not in there. And at first, it doesn't seem like anything is wrong until they notice her cell phone, her keys, her purse, and her laptop are all still in there. This made the police... Yeah, because you don't want to leave your keys and your cell phone in there. Especially those two things you're not going to leave in there at all. Because you're going to need those. So, yeah, it makes sense. That would probably be the point where I'm like, okay, so that, there's something wrong here think there could be something sinister happening here and so they went to lauren's friends and family and they asked does she have any enemies does she have any reason to be fearful for her life initially they said no no one would want to harm lauren everybody loves lauren but lauren's sister would say to the police that there was actually one comment lauren made a year ago that now seemed a little bit more relevant lauren had just got back from a vacation and she noticed there were things in her apartment that seemed like they had been moved like someone else had been here but no one was supposed to be in her apartment. And so she told her sister and the two of them talked about it a little bit, but it was quickly forgotten about because there wasn't a reasonable explanation and Lauren was so busy with school, she didn't pursue it. After police have done a thorough investigation of the inside of Lauren's apartment, they move outside of her apartment and begin scanning the exterior of the building and they make a huge discovery. An officer who was looking in the dumpster noticed this big black trash bag that looked out of place. And when he tried to move it, it was very heavy. And when they opened it, they found a human torso and it was Lawrence. Right. Wow. So they found a torso in a garbage bag in a dumpster in her apartment building. Who did this to this poor girl? Right before this discovery was made, a news crew had shown up outside the apartment building and was trying to interview people that lived in the apartment complex because they had been tipped off that somebody who was living here had been missing for over a week and now police were getting involved. They saw what looked like a resident of the building looking visibly shaken up, watching the police doing their investigation, and they went over to interview him. It would turn out his name was Stephen McDaniel and he was Lauren's neighbor and he was a classmate of hers in Long God, he looks like one creepy, crazy bastard, don't he? Jesus Christ, you're one creepy bastard. Law school. The interviewer asked Stephen, what was your last interaction with Lauren? And Stephen became really focused on how he had not seen her in the last week. And in fact, speaking on behalf of my other classmates, no one's seen her. She must have just vanished. As they're doing this interview, right on the other side of a bush, this police officer discovers Lauren's torso and the news kind of gets out to the interviewer, they've found a body. And the interviewer says out loud to Stephen, it looks like they found a body. And Stephen just completely changes and he goes, a body? 
and then he goes completely silent to the point where the interviewer says, are you okay? And he just stands there looking completely distant before walking away from the interviewer, sitting down with his back turned and hyperventilates before the interview ends. Once this case went from missing Steven, what did you do to this innocent woman, Steven? person to homicide the police started searching all the rooms on Lauren's floor and Stephen's room is right next to Lauren's so he was the first room they searched apparently as they began searching his room he was standing just outside the door and sweating profusely and drank over 10 bottles of water in his apartment they found a key to Lauren's apartment and what he would do is whenever she was gone he would sneak into her room and download her hard drive as well as steal little souvenirs like small articles of clothing Steven, you fucked up fuck. What the hell's wrong with you? What do you what what you hold up hold up how many time in that? What you just you just break into someone's house and just steal download the hard drive that you fucking crazy creepy bastard? What's wrong with you, Steven? You Steven, you're fucked up man. You're fucked up. I knew you were creepy and crazy. I, I saw it in your eyes. You're creepy crazy ass. Thing and other things that he would hoard in his apartment. When they went on Steven's computer and checked his browser history, basically the only things he did on the internet were look at Lauren's Facebook and LinkedIn profiles. That's fun. See, he creepy. He creepy and crazy. He creepy and crazy. But the creepiest thing they found was this camera that was literally duct taped to this long pole. And on the camera were all these surveillance videos of Lauren because what he would do is he would go outside and he would hoist up this camera and he would film her through her windows in the middle of the night. Steven was- There's so much wrong with this boy, so much. You creepy, crazy bastard! was quickly charged with Lauren's murder, to which he pled guilty, and he would openly confess to the details of how she died in court. Most times, he used this surveillance footage to confirm she was not in her apartment so he could sneak in and steal from her. But on the day she was murdered, he would use that camera technique to confirm she was home. And shortly after confirming she was in fact home and asleep, he put on a mask and used his key to get into her apartment and walked right into her room, which woke her up. According to Steven, she apparently sat up and said, you need to leave. At this point, he jumps on the bed and in their struggle, his mask would come off and Lauren would recognize it's clearly Steven and she would plead with him by name to stop, but he didn't stop and he would strangle her to death. Afterwards, he dragged her into the bathroom and began cutting her up into fairly small pieces. This dude is a psychotic, fucked up human being. Psychotic, fucked up human being. There was no justification for it. I don't want anyone to try it. This dude is fucked up. Pieces. Some of those pieces got flushed down the toilet. The others were put in bags, and only one of those bags was ever discovered, and that was the one of her torso. Stephen was ultimately given a life sentence. Here is a highlight of Stephen's interview when it's revealed that they've discovered Lauren's body. I mean, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, I've always hear noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. Mm -hmm. What about um, in the, like, the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Um, body? Had you heard, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? Uh, I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's why we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I think I need to sit down. Okay. You can see this thing. That cameraman fell in his gut problem. He kept following you. I want to see what this guy's going to do when he walks away. So that's going to do it. So that's going to do it, guys. As he was going to say, that's it, everybody. That's it for this reaction video. Hope you all enjoyed it. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, comment what you think down below of these, these stories and these videos. Thank you all for watching. I will see you for the next one.